precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a great privilege for us to come together in the presence of God to uh, learn from the Word of God, especially from the Book of Revelation. And uh, we are here in the presence of God. Uh, so uh, I will ask, uh, I mean, anyone to share the the previous portions that we covered already uh, uh, last week. Maybe, okay, I think uh, uh, maybe uh, before one week. So we covered one portion about uh, the uh, uh, church at Pergamos. So who can who can share that uh, uh, portion? Just raise your hands and uh, I can see. So you can share that. Is there anyone? Nobody is there. It's there. That note is there with you. Yes, Amy George. So uh, we started with the source of promise. So the source of promise, Jesus, who is the first and last, who was dead and who came to life. And then we started with Church of Pergamum and um, like what is the important it is the compromising church and then we said the city where it is located um it's a city on hill and down the valley and uh, like what are, are the details we uh, read through that then um establishment of church at pergamum paul had preached the gospel and uh, he was the founder of pergamum church then message to the church of pergamum about appreciations I know where you dwell. I know you hold fast my name. I know you did not renounce your faith. Um, and uh, then the weakness, weak points, mainly two weak points were mentioned. Uh, some people following doctrine of Balaam and some people are following the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So, uh, so we already uh, just discussed it about the uh, weak points of Pergamos Church in the uh, previous class, but uh, today let me let me uh, uh, try to explain about the uh, weak points of that church mentioned in uh, chapter two, verses fourteen and fifteen. The weak points or the errors which is mentioned in uh, uh, chapter two, verses fourteen and fifteen. So now we start with that uh, point number B, weak points. Point number B, weak points. That is from chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. We will read that verses uh, in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Then we will uh, uh, I mean, study from that point. Who is supposed to read and who is ready to read? But I have a few things against you. You have some, you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they may eat food and sacrificed to the idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have, so also you have some who have, who hold the teaching of Nicol Nicolaitans. Amen. So uh, okay. So uh, we'll be spending. Uh, more time to focus about uh, uh, this point because uh, this is very uh, serious and uh, uh, we have to carefully study about uh, uh, these things from uh, these two I mean, verses. You know, uh, uh, you have to understand one thing, uh, in spite of uh, the fidelity of the church at Pergamum, uh, there were errors and that we can see in these verses. So there are mainly two weak points. You know, I already told you the uh, two weak points so you already written. But uh, I mean, I'm going to explain all those things. Now you will get the I mean, uh, PowerPoints and the screen sharing also, uh, I mean, along with this. So there are mainly two weak points mentioned about uh, the Pergamos church. The first one is there are some people follow the doctrine of Bala. There are some people follow the doctrine of Bala. So it is written there. 
but I have a few things against you because you have three, or you have there some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So the first error or the first weakness of that uh, church at Pergamos is there are some people follow the doctrine of Bala. You know, who is this Bala? Who is this Bala? If, when you read uh, um, in, uh, Numbers chapter 22 and 23 and 24, those chapters, even, even uh, chapter 25 also, uh, uh, we can see that uh, uh, what is about Bala and who was Bala and what is the speciality uh, of uh, the, the, the prophet Bala. You know, uh, he, there we can see that he was a prophet from a Gentile background. So Bala uh, was a prophet from Gentile background and he knows very well about Jehovah God and the people of Israel, but he was a perverted prophet. We can call him as a perverted uh, a prophet. Uh, we will see what are the reasons that we can call him as a perverted prophet. I mean, uh, so that is what we are going to see. So in Numbers chapter 22, uh, 23, and 24, and 25, we read Balak, the king of Moab, is hiring Balaam to curse the people of Israel, to curse the people of Israel. But God told him not to go for that. You don't go for that. Many times God told him, you don't go for that. You are not supposed to do that. But he started to plead with God and asked, hey, God, uh, they are calling me, I mean, again and again, shall I go with them and prophesy against the uh, Israel? Then at last, God said, go with them, but speak only the word which I speak to you. All the way, while he was traveling on the donkey, something strange happened uh, with Bala. That is, that is what we read in uh, uh, Numbers chapter 22, verses 23 uh, uh, through 28. We will read that verse, then only we will uh, get the, uh, the, the clear meaning of that point. You know, Numbers chapter 22, verses 23 uh, uh, to 28. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road into a field. Balaam be beat it to get it back on the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in the narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Yeah. So in these verses, uh, we can see that the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with a, with a sword and donkey turned off from the way. And so then we see that three times Balaam uh, uh, struck the donkey uh, and, uh, and in verse, verse 28, 28, the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and donkey started to talk to Balaam. This was the real, uh, this, is, this is what really happened. And it was, a, it was a strange thing for Bala. You know, the donkey started to speak. Then that was a strange thing for Bala. So let me just remind you one thing that God can use anything to speak to us. God can use anything to speak to us. You know, he was not listening the word of God. He was not listening the, the, the command of God that he should not go. But that Bala, the prophet Bala, I mean, uh, getting ready to go for that. And uh, I mean, even uh, uh, the, the, the donkey is speaking to him. And uh, we have to understand, you know, God can use anything to speak to us. Here we see he did not obey the word of God and even the speech of the donkey also. I mean, so he just moves forward to curse the people of Israel only with the purpose of gaining the material blessings offered by the King Balak. Now we are coming to the point. You know, there were, I mean, some people, you know, we read that the, the first error or the first weakness of that church is there are some people follow the doctrine of Bala. 
Now we are going to look into the poem. I mean, what was the doctrine of Bala? What was the doctrine of Bala? You know, here we can see that he was doing everything and he was going forward to curse the people of Israel only with the purpose of gaining the material blessings, which was offered by the king of uh, king of, uh, uh, the, the king Balak. Okay, he was a, he was the I mean, uh, uh, the king of I mean, Moab. You know, this is the evil doctrine of Balaam, which is mentioned in Revelation chapter two, verse fourteen. Also, you know, in Revelation chapter two, verse fourteen, it is mentioned about the evil doctrine of the Bala. This is the I mean, doctrine. So you know, uh, uh, there were many I mean prophets in those days, and even in in our days also, uh, there are many prophets with uh, uh, these kinds of uh, doctrine. These kinds of doctrine. You know, they are uh, ready to prophesy and preach anything to get money. So the only thing that they need is money. I mean, they are ready to do anything. They are ready to minister anything, and they are ready to prophesy anything. Okay, whatever it may be. I mean, only for the money, only for the material blessing. The people, the, the the ministers and the prophets are ready to speak anything. So we we should be very 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 serious about them. We should be very careful about all those things. I mean, I mean, and let me let me tell you one thing that never promote anyone who is doing the ministry with the purpose of gaining money or wealth or fame. I mean, there are many people doing the ministry uh, with only the purpose of gaining money or the wealth or the fame, because this is the uh, this is the deception which uh, uh, many Christians do not understand. But uh, uh, let us follow the support the ministers who preach that money is nothing, and you cannot gain in anything with money. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we have to promote and we have to support the people those who are thinking that okay, uh, the money is nothing and we cannot gain anything with money. But we have to do the ministry. We have to do the I mean work of the Lord for the glory of God, not for the personal gain. I mean, so here we understand from the history of the Balaam that Balaam was ready to speak and ready to prophesy anything only with the purpose of gaining money and the blessing of uh, the, 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 the material blessings that which was, which was offered by uh, Balak the king. So uh, the serious thing to remember about the church at Pergamos and also about the people of Israel in the book of Numbers is written in Numbers chapter 25. This is the serious thing. You know, that is written in Numbers chapter 25. The people of Israel, I mean, start compromising with the Gentile people and Gentile gods. Okay, so when you read uh, Numbers chapter 25, there are many things written that the people of Israel, they started to compromise with the Gentile people and the Gentile gods. I mean, you know, you know Balak was a king of Moab, he tried to curse the people of Israel, but that did not work out. Balaam the prophet blessed them. Amen. So, you know, he was trying to curse the people of Israel. Okay. But that did not work out. And when he started to speak something, God said, you speak whatever I give in your mouth. So Balak started to bless, the, sorry, Balaam started to bless, I mean, uh, the people of Israel. You know, now that did not work out. Now the next strategy of the Moab and the, 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 the prophet Balaam and also the, the king Balak is getting mingled with them or making some kind of compromise. You know, this is the second strategy that we can understand that mingling with the people and also making some of the compromise with the, the people of God. So the Gentile people and the pagan people and the pagan kings and those people are getting, I mean, mingled with the, the people of Israel. That is what we read in uh, uh, Numbers chapter 25, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. We will read that verse, then we will move on. I mean, Numbers chapter 25, verses 1, 2, and 3. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to war with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifice to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Yes. So what happens there? It is very clear that the people of Israel brought wives from the daughters of Moab. Brought wives from the daughters of Moab. They got married with them 
and Gentile women became the members of the Jewish families. You know, uh, it, it, was not, uh, it was not allowed for the Jewish people to get married with the Gentile people. But at the same time, here we understand that, you know, in Numbers chapter 25, it is, it, it is, it is very, I mean, a serious thing to understand that these people, I mean, bringing wives from the daughters of Moab, and they got married with them, and Gentile women became the members of the Jewish families. Then these women invited them to sacrifice of their God, and they ate and bowed down to their God. This is what is happening in that chapter. So the second strategy of Moab or Satan was compromise and adjustments. Compromise and adjustments. I mean, now, uh, when you read, uh, I mean, uh, Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, that also we will read. Numbers chapter 31, verse 16. Behold, these on the Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came along the congregation of the Lord. So here we see that these things happened only because of the advice of Balaam the prophet. Balaam the prophet. He was a prophet. He was a real prophet. But when the motives are changing, you know, the, the, the speech also changes and the prophecy also changes. And this is what is happening. You now all things happens in the, in the history of the people of Israel only because of the advice of Balaam the prophet. So because Balaam was knowing that by when Israel mingle with Gentiles and worship the idols, then the Lord will get angry against them and will destroy them. This is a truth. You know, Balaam, the prophet was knowing very clearly that when the people of Israel is mingling with the Gentile people and they, when they worship the idols, then the Lord himself will get angry with these people and God himself will destroy the people of Israel. So that really happened in the history of Israel. That really happened in the history of Israel. And that is what we read in Numbers chapter 25, verse 9. Numbers chapter 25, verse 9 says, 24,000 people, Israel people were, died by the plague. Okay, 24,000 people were died by the plague. Okay, the people of Israel. So this is the, this is the history that we get from the book of Numbers only because of the advice and the wrong doctrine, false doctrine, which was made by the Balaam, the prophet. Okay? So the same strategy of compromising entered into the church at Pergamos also, and also in many other churches today. This is the reason this church is known as the compromising church. So I told you, even, even in the, even the pre previous class also, I mean, this church, the church at Pergamos is known as the compromising church. This is the reason for that. You know, the compromising strategy entered into the church at Pergamos. I mean, so this is the reason we are calling the church at Pergamos. And because, you know, God is appreciating them for many things. At the same time, at last, he's, I mean, pointing out some of the big points. The big point is, I mean, there are, in your church also, there are some people still following the, the evil doctrines of Balaam. So the doctrine of Balaam is known as the Gnosticism. Okay, Gnosticism. The, 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 the doctrine of Balaam. Okay, that means they say you can do anything in your flesh or body that never affect your spirit. What is the, what is the doctrine of Balaam? The doctrine of Balaam is Gnosticism. That means they always say that you can do anything in your flesh. You can do anything in your flesh and your body. That never affects your spirit. So you can enjoy all the worldly pleasures in your body. That will not affect your spirit. That will not affect your spirit. So mainly, the two, these two kinds of doctrines of Bala mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 verse 14 these are the doctrines of living and working only with the motive of earning money. And the second one is the doctrine of compromising with the world and the worldly pleasures. These are the two main doctrines of Balaam, which is uh, I mean, mentioned in uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 14. So let us 
let us how uh, let us I mean see how Satan he, I mean uh, using uh, his two kinds of strategies in the I mean churches at Pergamos. You know that is very important. We have to know how Satan was using these kinds of strategies in the church at Pergamos. And we know that at first, I mean, through the persecution, uh, Satan is trying to defeat the Christianity. That is the first uh, strategy that uh, Satan is trying to defeat the Christianity. What is that? I mean, through persecution, Satan was thinking and the Roman government was uh, thinking that through persecution, we, we, we will be able to defeat the Christianity and the Christian churches. I mean, but uh, uh, as the persecution increased, what happened? The church also was growing. When there was persecution, the church was growing. That's a reality. When there was persecution, the church was growing. That did not work out. At the same time, the second strategy, what is that? And secondly, Satan decided to defeat the church by winkling and compromising with the church. Winkling and compromising with the church. This is very interesting to understand that Satan has different, different strategies to defeat the Christian churches and the Christians and the leaders of the Christian church. I mean, here, the second strategy, the first one is, I mean, trying to persecute the church. And they were thinking that through persecution, we will be able to defeat the church. But that did not work out. When they were persecuting the church, the church also was growing, growing rapidly. Then at the same time, the second strategy is, okay, we will do one thing. We will defeat the church by mingling with them and compromising with them. Uh, with, and when we compromise with them, when we mingle with them, we will be able to defeat the church. So that is a strategy. I mean, uh, uh, the second strategy of uh, Satan that we can understand from this portion. You know, we will go to First uh, Peter chapter five verse eight. First Peter chapter five verse eight. You know, uh, and uh, uh, I'll give you two verses. First Peter chapter five verse eight and Genesis chapter. Three verse one. Okay, read that uh, first Peter chapter five verse eight first. Then we will read Genesis chapter three verse one. Be sober minded. Be watchful. Your ad adverse advisory, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Yeah. Genesis chapter three verse one. Genesis three one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat, you shall not eat of any of the tree in the garden? Amen. Very good. Thank you, Elsa, for quickly reading the verses, Bible verses from New Testament and, and Old Testament. Okay. God bless you. So, you know, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we see Satan is working like a roaring lion, right? Satan is working like a, like a roaring lion. What is that? Alaruna Simcham Bole. Alaruna Simcham Bole, Pravartik in the Satan. But in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we see that Satan is using his tricks and, I mean, uh, what is that? Craftiness to Eve and politely speaking to her about the benefits of the fruit. And through that, Eve was fallen. Got the point? You know, in, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse, we see that Satan is working like a a roaring lion, roaring lion. So we'll be, we'll be, I mean, getting afraid of the Satan when we see a, a, a roaring lion. But secondly, the second strategy is we can see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, that Satan is using the trick and Satan is showing the craftiness and politely speaking to Eve and saying that, okay, these are the benefits of the fruit. And if you eat this fruit, I mean, you also will become like. God. I mean, through that, he was fallen. So this is the same trick or scheme Satan is using today in our Christian churches to destroy the ministers and the believers. The same trick is there of Satan. He is using, I mean, very cleverly. I mean, very, he is very clever. And uh, with that craftiness and that trick, uh, I mean, he, he is using that to destroy the ministers and the believers of the Christian churches. Many times, you know, uh, we are not aware about that. The pastors are not aware about that. The priests are not aware about that. The believers are not aware about that. But this is what happening in our church also, even today. 
I mean, now we will go to the, I mean, uh, the, the history of the ancient Christian church. You know, uh, let, me, let me tell you one thing. You know, we should know what happened for the Christian church in the ancient period. We should know something about the history. You know, without knowing the history, uh, something about the history, we won't be able to uh, understand what happened to the churches in the ancient time. So what was the problem and what was the uh, reasons of the uh, defeat and destruction of the Christian churches in the earlier time? So now we will go to the uh, some of the I mean, points from the uh, history of the ancient Christian church. You know, in AD 312, in AD 312, Constantine and his soldiers had a battle or war with Emperor I mean, uh, Galerius. Okay, so Constantine and his soldiers had a battle with Emperor's Galerius. So I'm, I'm going to talk about, I mean, how Satan is attacking or how Satan is trying to defeat the Christianity in the ancient time. Even today also, this is going to happen. Okay, so we, we should be very careful about these things. What happens there? In, in AD uh, 312, Constantine and his soldiers had a battle or war with the emperor Galerius. Okay, so he was, a, I mean, Galerius was the emperor of Roman, I mean, empire. So Christians also, what happens there, Christians also joined with Constantine and in that battle. So Constantine got victory and he became the Roman emperor with the help of the Christians. You know, when he was going, Constantine was going for the battle with the Galerius, you know, uh, the history says that, okay, the, the, the Christians also said, okay, we are also coming with you and uh, we will also, I mean, fight against the Galerius and we'll be standing with you. Constantine said, okay, you come. And what happened in that battle, in that war, Constantine got victory and he became the Roman emperor. That was with the help of the Christian people. And Constantine converted to Christianity. That, that is what happened in, in that history. You know, Constantine also converted to Christianity. Okay, then he gave an order that no one should persecute Christians. This was the order of order of Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, that no one should persecute Christians in Rome. And he made the cross as the symbol of Christians. This is the reality. And he made the cross, cross of Jesus Christ as the symbol of Christians. In those days, the, the, the cross was not uh, uh, the, the same thing that we have now, but it was it was a, it was a kind of into okay so so that is what so so he made the cross as a symbol of Christians so during the time of Constantine there was no persecution because the Christians supported Constantine and they were fighting uh, together with uh, Galerius and they got the victory through the help of the Christian people so during the time of Constantine Emperor there was no persecution for the Christians. And again, and he, crow, I mean, uh, and 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 cross the symbol uh, because uh, I mean he made the cross as a symbol of Christian and uh, uh, making the cross as a symbol of Christian. There are uh, the there are some other uh, stories also that uh, uh, Constantine got a I mean vision in in the night time and uh, according to that only that, that that's another history. Okay, so uh, that because of that only he uh, made all these things like this. Okay, and he declared the Christianity as a religion. This is a, this is a very important point. He declared the Constantine declared the Christianity as a religion. Remember, till that time Christianity was not at all a religion. It was a way to the truth. And it was just a, I mean, just a, I mean, uh, uh, the faith, okay? All the Christians and the leaders were standing in the faith and they were, I mean, standing firm for Jesus Christ. Always they were, I mean, uh, boasting Jesus Christ and always they were praising Jesus Christ. I mean, this is not at all a religion, a religion. Then the Christian church became a political party also. The Christian church became the political party. And Christian leaders got the authority to rule the Roman Empire. The Christian leaders got the authority to rule the Roman Empire. And the papal supreme authority was introduced by Constantine. 
these all things are happening in, in that place through the Constantine, the emperor. So Emperor Constantine adopted many pagan rituals and celebrations and introduced to the Christians. Uh, even today, I mean, majority of the Christian organizations are still following all those pagan rituals and celebrations. Uh, some of the pagan celebrations knowingly or unknowingly. We do not know. I mean, the, uh, we do not uh, think about the history, uh, 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 how it was formed and how, how it was adopted to the Christianity. You know, uh, this Emperor Constantine uh, is the person who, I mean, converted to Christianity. And uh, what he did was he adopted many pagan rituals and uh, uh, many celebrations from the, uh, from the pagans and the Gentiles. And he introduced those celebrations and those uh, uh, rituals, I mean, to the Christians. And even, you know, a majority of the Christian organization today, I mean, they are still following all those pagan like rituals and some of the celebrations also uh, without uh, the knowledge. You know, you, they, they did not think about, I mean, how it was, I mean, adopted and how it came to the Christianity. And they are just, I mean, celebrating. There is no problem in celebrating something, but at the same time, we should know what is the background of that and how that came to the Christianity and all those things. I mean, I'm leaving that point. Here. And I have the, you know, uh, uh, actually I have some of the uh, list with me uh, about uh, those rituals uh, uh, that uh, which that says that uh, I mean uh, the rituals influence influence the Christianity and the year and the year when it was uh, adopted by Christian leaders. I mean, uh, so I have a list, and if you need that list personally, you can contact me, and I will I will forward to you. I mean, so this is I mean I cannot give you that list now. But uh, I can I can give you later if you contact me for that list. Okay, there are many things I mean which was adopted. The, the the pagan rituals were adopted by the Christian leaders in the in the earlier time from maybe uh, AD 300 and uh, uh, then maybe 300 and 400 and si up till 600. Okay, there were many things. So I'll I'll, I'll give you about uh, the, the points about that and the list about that later. Okay, so uh, this is the reason. Uh, uh, this is the reason that uh, when we study about the uh, Pergamos Church also, we can say that the perversion happened to the Christianity. The perversion happened to the Christianity. You know, automatically they started to mingle with the other people and compromise with all the worldly things. Okay, this is a strategy, a strategy of Satan also. They are starting to mingling with the other people and compromising with all the worldly things. And they replaced Jesus with the human leaders. That means they were giving more importance for the leaders or the religious leaders. I mean, religious leaders means in Rome, the Christianity became the leadership and they were leading. So they were, I mean, uh, they were ruling. So what happened? The people started to give more importance for the leaders of the religion, leaders of the religion other than Jesus. So they replaced Jesus with the human leaders and they gave more preference to the structure of the church and tradition than the word of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ and the apostles, they were giving the clear picture about what is the Christianity, but the perversion is happening during the time of Emperor Constantine. And Constantine introduced many, many pagan rituals and celebration into Christianity. And the people started to give more preference and importance for the, for the I mean, structure of the church and the tradition of the church. And I mean, uh, then the teachings of Jesus Christ and his appointed apostles. And there comes the spiritual destruction of the Christianity. So this is very, I mean, this is very, uh, dangerous and this is very carefully we have to study about the history of the Christianity and how the Christianity in those days in the ancient time it was destruct I mean destroyed or defeated by the I mean uh, main two strategies of I mean Satan so this is this is the this is the uh, small explanation about the, uh, the, the the defeat of the Christian churches in the ancient uh, history now uh, in 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 uh, we will go to the next portion that is uh, in the New Testament there are uh, three things mentioned about Bala. There are three things mentioned about Bala. So after the class we will be 
uh, I'll be giving a few minutes for discussion, or if you have any question also, you can ask from that portion. Uh, now we will continue that uh, main, uh, uh, classes. Then after the class, we will give you uh, time for discussion. So now we will go to the, uh, uh, the point is, uh, I mean, in New Testament, there are uh, three uh, things mentioned about the Bala, Bala, the prophet. Number one, the way of Bala. The way of Bala. We will read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Forsaking the right, the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who gained, who who loved gain from wrongdoing. Yeah. What is the what is the way of Bala? It is clearly written there. It is a perverted way. It is a perverted way. Who loved the wages of unrighteousness? Who loved the wages of unrighteousness? I mean, forsaking the right way. They have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. We already saw that in Numbers chapter, Numbers chapter 23, I think. Okay, so this is what happens with the prophet Balaam. What is that? The perverted way. Okay, the perverted way. He is going away from the right way and he is passing through the the wrong way who loved the wages of unrighteousness he was seeking for the wages and the and the blessings of the unrighteousness okay so he was not in the righteous way he was from the unrighteous way the second second speciality which is uh, mentioned about bala is in jude 11 jude chapter uh, 1 verse 11 there is only one chapter in jude uh, verse 11 verse 11 we read that Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. What is that? The second one. Second, second thing, which is uh, I mean, uh, written and mentioned about Balaam, is the work or error of deceiving. So this is a spirit and this is a kind of uh, uh, character that uh, uh, Balaam was having, the deceiving spirit, deceiving spirit. Okay. The work of error, uh, it is written there, or the, the dece deceiving spirit. Okay, And the third one is uh, mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, we already uh, I mean, uh, read that one. And the counsel of Balaam led people of Israel to the idol worship and immorality. Okay, What happened? Because of the advice of Balaam, Balaam you know, that became a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So this, this is the third mentioning about uh, Balaam, the prophet, the council of Balaam led the people of Israel to the idol worship and immorality. I mean, so these are the three things. Now we will go to the second mentioned weak point of Pergamos church in Revelation chapter two, verse 15, Revelation chapter 2, verse 15, uh, that is, uh, there are some people follow the doctrine of the Colossians. There are some people follow the doctrine of Nicolaitans. This is the second weak point that is mentioned about the church at Pergamos. Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. Yes, we will read that more, verse. So also you have some who hold teaching of Nicolaitans. You have some people teaching or following the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans, okay? So we already studied uh, uh, many things about this group of people. What is that? Nicolaitans. Uh, while we were uh, 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 learning about the church at Ephesus, and I hope you still remember those points and those things. 
uh, about uh, uh, the group called uh, Nicol Nicolaitans. And uh, I don't uh, take time to repeat all those things. So uh, the, you, you know that, okay? Already we discussed about that. So these are the uh, main two errors or weak points that is mentioned about the church at Pergamon. There are two things, which is that there are some people following the doctrine of Balaam. So you already saw that what are the teachings and the doctrines uh, of Balaam. And second one is uh, uh, there are some people following the doctrine of Nicolaitans. Okay, that also you know. And uh, I mean, quickly, we will go to the point number, point number C, point number C. Yeah, point number C is suggestion. Point number C is suggestion. That is uh, from Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Yes. You know, what is that? Repent. Eh? Therefore. Repent. What is the meaning of the re I mean, uh, therefore? Therefore means if you are following or if you are still continuing the teachings and practicing the, the teachings of doctrines of Balaam and Nicolaitans. I mean, so if you are not repenting, then there is a warning. Okay, now the suggestion is repent. The suggestion is repent. The Greek word which is used for repent is metanoia. Metanoia. Okay, so metanoia is the Greek word which is used for repent. That, I mean, uh, uh, that is not uh, a simply saying, uh, you know, some people used to say like, oh, I am mistaken, I'm sorry, you know, I'm fallen, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all. Some people, when, when they do some sin or when they do some mistakes, they say, I'm sorry, or I'm mistaken, okay? But actually, the meaning of the metanoio or repent is change your mind, change your mind, okay? So uh, there, should be a, uh, there should be a radical change in our life and be away from all kinds of filthiness and unholy things. So this is the meaning of that repent, the word repent means, you know, uh, you know the, the, the hagio, hagios is the Greek word for holiness also, holiness, you know, the holiness means, you know, when I was uh, taking the uh, adult class, I told you already, you know, hagios and uh, the, the holiness means uh, in biblical a uh, way we, we can we can say that it is a separation separation for example the things the the, the instruments which was used in the, the temple and the tabernacle uh, that was used only for that purpose it was not supposed to take away from there and uh, it was not supposed to use for any other purposes that means you know when we are holy we should be very concentrated in the presence of god and we should be very I mean, uh, uh, repented in the presence of God. You know, simply, it's not saying, okay, I'm sorry, or I'm fallen, and I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken, I have many mistakes. No, it's not like that. You know, we have to have a radical change in our Christian life. You know, this is a change your mind, and we should have a radical change. I mean, and we should be away from all kinds of filthiness and the unholy uh, things of this world and worldly pleasures. Now, quickly, we will go to the point number D. Point number D is a warning. Point number D is warning. That is from chapter 2, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. Point number D, warning. Chapter 2, verse 16, Revelation. Yeah, read, Elsa. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon, war against them with the sword of my mouth. There it says that, if not, therefore repent. If not means, if you are not repenting, then Jesus says that, I'm coming to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. With the sword of my mouth. So I will come quickly 
and will fight against them with this word of my mouth. You know, here, when you read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, and Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it is written here, the word of my mouth. Jesus says, the word of my mouth. Okay, the, the, the sword of his mouth. That speaks about the word of God. That speaks about the word of God. That we know that uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 and Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17. It is very clear. No, there is no need to read that verses. Okay, It's very clear. That speaks about uh, especially the teenagers. Okay, in our teenagers class, we have been uh, learning many things about uh, the specialities and the benefits and the importance of the word of God. Okay, so Elsa is there and Elsa knows that and Danny is there uh, and some others are there. So you know that, okay, what are the uh, specialities of the word of God and the benefits of the word of God for the people of God. Okay, so that is what the word of his mouth means, the word of God, which comes from the mouth of God. Amen. So again, the other thing, which is mentioned there is I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. So there are two things about uh, this portion that we have to think about. Okay. I am coming quickly. Jesus said, I am coming quickly. This is not only refers to the second coming of Jesus. Okay. Not only referring to the second coming of Jesus, but also refers to his chastisement and punishment, which he gives to the perverted and deviated this is very important. You know, there are many perverted people. There are many deviated people from the presence of God, from the teachings of Jesus Christ, from the doctrines of the apostles. So Jesus says that, okay, I, I, I have the second coming is there. Just wait for that. At the same time, now, today, what Jesus is doing, he is chastising the people to get to, get to the right way. Amen. And he is punishing the people sometimes. Amen. Only the perverted people, the I mean, what is that? The, 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 the deviated people. And also, this, I mean, usage is reminding us about Jesus who is going to judge and punish his enemies in future. In future, Jesus is going to, I mean, judge and punish his enemies in future with his word of mouth. That is what we read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. We read that verse. Revelation chapter 19, verse 21. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds who were gorged with their flesh. Yes, what is that? Okay, the, 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 the power is coming and the word is coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ. That has the authority, that has the power to judge and punish his enemies in the future, in the future, okay? So these are the two things we are getting from that warning that Jesus is saying that if not repenting, I am coming, I mean, uh, quickly and fight against those people uh, with the, the sword of my mouth. And also, I mean, uh, he says that, okay, I have the sword of the sword in my mouth. That speaks about the word of God. We will quickly go to the next point, point number, point number E. That is the promise of reward. The promise of reward. From Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. The promise of reward. You know, after, uh, uh, after the class, we have we have to spend few minutes for some of the urgent prayer requests out there. We'll be praying for that, okay, after the class. So uh, we will go to that point. Point number E, the promise of reward. The promise of reward, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. You know, there are uh, three main rewards promised to the people uh, uh, at, uh, I mean, uh, church at um, Pergamos and who overcomes, okay? This is a symbolic usage. Don't take it as a literal meaning, but it is a symbolic usage, okay? There are mainly three important things are mentioned there and three important rewards are promised for the people, those who are overcoming. So we'll read that verse once again, chapter two, verse 70. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with the new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Amen. So, what is that promise? There are three promises, I mean, promises of rewards. The number one is the hidden manna. I told you, don't take it as a literal meaning, but take the symbolic usage of that I mean, portions. Okay, point number A, that means the, the first I mean, reward. The first reward is the hidden manna, the hidden manna. So what is manna? Okay, manna is the food that God provided for the people of Israel from heaven. That's what we read in Exodus chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. Exodus chapter 16, verses 11 through 15. What is manna? Manna is the food that God provided for the people of Israel while they were traveling in the wilderness. Wilderness, okay? And from it was from heaven. And manna is the grain of heaven. Psalm number 78, verse 24. Manna is the grain of heaven. And again, Psalm number 78, verse 25 says, Manna is the bread of the angels. Manna is the bread of the angels. And again, Psalm number 105, verse 40. Psalm number 105, verse 40 says that manna is the bread of heaven. Manna is the bread of heaven. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, Manna is the spiritual food. Manna is the spiritual food. Only that verse we will read. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Maybe three and four also, yeah. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from the spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Christ. But now it's the spiritual food. You know, what is the meaning of the word mana? Meaning of the word mana in Exodus chapter 16, verse 15. It is there in your, your in your PowerPoint. What is this? Okay, you know, when they saw the mana men uh, around their uh, I mean, tent, you know, they were not knowing what is that. I mean, first time they are seeing, and they asked, What is this? What is this? Either, either end, either end. Okay. So, uh, and then after that, uh, you know, uh, the people were uh, uh, calling that, okay, mana is, what is this? What is this? Okay. So the word of God today is really a hidden mana or the bread of life. Okay. So you can, you can think about what is the mana, you know, what is the promise of the, or, or the reward, which is for the, I mean, uh, church at Pragamos and also for the people of God who is overcoming the worldly pressures. Okay. For them. The word of God today is the real hidden manna or the bread of life. You know, this is a mystery. The word of God is a mystery for us, but only for the people who seek for the word of God will find the hidden truth of the word of God. There are many hidden truths in the Bible. Okay, If you are not simply living, you will not get anything. But the people, those who are trying to, get the truth of the Bible. And those who are sitting in the presence of God, meditating the word of God, listening the Bible studies and all, and those people, because of the eagerness of those people, they are getting the hidden manna even today from the word of God, from the word of God. At the same time, at the same time, John chapter 6, verses 33 to 35. John chapter 6, verses 33 to 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life, which came down from 
heaven. So who is the bread of life and who is the manna for the people of God? Jesus Christ is the manna for the people of God. Amen. So Jesus himself is the bread of life and he came down from heaven. He died for the sinners and he resurrected from and ascended. And now he is sitting in heaven at the right hand of father. And we are not able to see him with, his, with, our, with, our, with our physical eyes. Okay, today, we are not able to see Jesus with our physical eyes. But we will see him, the hidden manna, one day face to face. I mean, how many of you believe that we are going to see Jesus Christ, the hidden manna? Okay? Now we are not able to see with our eyes. But we will be seeing Jesus Christ with our physical eyes. I mean, I mean, face to face. I mean, what a, what a, what a wonderful, I mean, uh, 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 situation it is going to be. I mean, so praise God for that. And we will go to the uh, the second uh, promise. The second promise. We'll finish that I mean, quickly. I mean, second second promise is in the same verse. I mean, uh, Revelation chapter two verse seventeen. That is the white stone. The white stone. The white stone. So I, I, let me give you a, a, a quickly a few things about uh, what is the what is the meaning of the white stone here mentioned here. White stone. Okay. So God is promising a reward just like a white stone. I will give you the white stone when you are coming, uh, uh, overcoming. I mean, then I'll give you. So in the ancient time, the court uh, used to have two stones. Two stones were there in the court. You know, uh, the white stone and the black stone. The white stone is there and the black stone is there. You know, after the judgment, if the judge is showing the black stone, if the judge is lifting the black stone and showing the black stone, that means the accused is punished. There is a punishment for the accused person. But if he's showing the white stone, that means the accused is innocent, okay, living alone. And I mean, I mean, he's, I mean, the accused one is innocent he doesn't do any crime so that is the that is the i mean practice that uh, i mean in the in the ancient time in inside the court that was happening so here it says that to him who overcomes i will give the white stone white stone I mean, so just think about one thing that once we were all sinners and uh, even the the, the per pergamos search also they were i mean attacked by the government and the enemies of uh, I mean, of the Roman emperor. So, uh, you know, even today, the church is accused by the other people and the enemies, okay? And uh, many things, but, but Jesus is, I mean, going to lift the white stone and, and he is going to say that they are innocent. We were sinners, but Jesus is, I mean, not accusing us because we are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, you believe that we are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ? Then Jesus is not lifting the black stone, but Jesus is lifting the white stone. And he says that, okay, I mean, you are overcome. You are an overcomer and come to me and I'm giving this white stone for you. You are, a, you are innocent because you are washed. Your sins are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, now quickly, we will go to the point number C. Point number C, that is the third promise which is given for the Church at Pergamos is a new name. A new name. A new name. In the same verse, it says, same verse, it says, stone which no one knows but he who receives it. A new name written on the stone which no one knows but, but who receives it. So the new name written on the stone is not known to anyone else but only that person and God. Okay. The new name, which is I mean, written on the stone, it is not known to anyone, but only for that person and for God. So this shows the respect and position which the people of God is going to receive from the Lord. I mean, you can call it as a, it, it is a con congratulation, you know, appreciation, you know, in, in one, some, I mean, athletes and everything, you know, when the people are winning, you know, the people or the, the other people will be and clapping their hands and appreciating them and congratulating them. Okay, so that is what what is going to happen. You know, they I mean they are getting a new name. 
And also we can speak about the intimacy between God and the child of God, the intimacy between the God and child of God. You know, even in Bible, when God gave a new name for somebody, somebody that shows the intimate relationship with him, intimate relation with him. You know, for example, uh, Abraham, Ab okay. Abraham was known as Abraham, but it was changed to Abraham. Abraham to Abraham, then Sarai to Sarah, then Jacob to Israel. Okay? So these are the changes that happen. That shows the intimacy with Jesus Christ, the people of God. When they are having the intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, I mean, that shows they are getting a new name and they are going to get a white stone and they are, I mean, going to get the hidden mana that is Jesus himself. I mean, so this is what we understand from these portions. Now we will, we will, we will pray and conclude the Bible study. Reggie brother is going to pray now. I mean, uh, uh, now we shall we all close our.